This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Maelstrom. Over the last couple of weeks here at the Word of the Week offices, things have been a bit chaotic. A lot of stuff has come up, a lot of changes, a lot of turbulence. Some good, some bad, but ultimately, all of it just a bit overwhelming. Life can be like that sometimes, right? Everyone's gone through that. When events beyond your control just sort of sweep you along and you have to go from fighting the current to just struggling to stay afloat lest you be dragged under or drowned or dashed against the rocks. And since we have to express everything in terms of epic fantasy adventures and grand myths and legends and that sort of thing, we're tempted here to say that we've been caught up in a maelstrom. But we won't say it. Because as entrepreneurs and content creators, we deeply respect the rights of creators to protect their creative works. And as linguists, we don't want to contribute to the demise of literal language by turning it into what philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once described as tired, dead metaphor, by burdening a once beautiful and highly specific word with a broad, boring, generic meaning. In short, we're sad to see Maelstrom go the way of the zipper. Just what are we rambling about? Well, eventually, we'll be rambling about the Maelstrom and whirlpools and vortices. But first, we need to talk about trademarks and clothing fasteners and hieroglyphics and Chinese vases. A trademark is a name, symbol, logo, or other device that is used to identify a specific product made by a specific person or by a specific company. And in most countries in the modern world, especially in the United States, the use of trademarks is legally protected. That is, once someone adopts, and in many cases registers, the use of a specific name, symbol, or logo, they are the only ones allowed to use it. When you see that name or logo or whatever, you know exactly who made it. But the trademark isn't just an invention of the modern world. In fact, it's a pretty old idea. The earliest known examples of trademarks date back to 500 BCE. At that time, it became the practice in China for potters to inscribe the name of the emperor in power on any of their craft work, as well as the location where the pottery was created and the name of the potter who made the piece. That's part of why Ming vases are Ming vases, because they were marked with a symbol indicating that they were made during the era in which the Ming Imperial Dynasty was ruling China. You see? And it wasn't just China. According to the Greek author from the Hellenic Age, Harapalon, the original point of Egyptian hieroglyphs wasn't to create a written form of a spoken language, but rather to provide simple symbols that represented different ideas. The word hieroglyph is actually Greek, and it means written idea. Harapalon cited examples of symbols that came from 700 BCE that were used by craftsmen to identify their goods as their own, which were some of the earliest known examples of hieroglyphic symbols at the time. And in the 12th century, in order to prevent trade in jewelry made of cheap stones and impure metals, King Edward I enacted a law prohibiting the sale of any jewelry that wasn't marked with an official stamp issued by Goldsmiths Hall a royal office in London. That mark was called a hall mark. And that's not even to mention the practice of smiths stamping their weapons and armor with their personal symbols or guild symbols during the Middle Ages, or any of the other hundreds of examples of merchants' marks, service marks, or guild hall marks throughout history. The point of all these symbols were simple. They provided a simple means to attest to the quality of goods, and in the event the goods weren't actually so good, they told you who to blame for the goods turning out to be bads. Anyone who bought Hallmark jewelry could be assured, under penalty of death according to King Edward's law, that the metal was pure and the gems were real. Beyond that, craftsmen could establish a reputation. Talented armors, smiths, and all sorts of craftsfolk could become known for their good work, and people would pay extra for goods manufactured by talented craftsmen, or manufactured in specific places. Craftsmen benefited because they could trade on their reputation, and customers benefited because they had an assurance of quality without having to put the goods they bought through elaborate tests, and when something bad happened, 
they knew who to hold responsible. Which is why Thomas Jefferson in 1791 advocated for the legal protection of trademarks in the fledgling United States of America. Unfortunately, the actual law didn't get enacted until 1870, and then it got repealed in a couple of legal battles, but in 1881, a new trademark law was enacted in the United States, and that one stuck. In 1905, the United States Patent and Trademark Office was established to handle registrations for the protection of intellectual property and trademarks. What does this have to do with the zipper? Well, that has to do with a problem called genericization, which is something modern companies all over the world are constantly fighting against. And the zipper is one of the earliest examples of the problem. Yes, the zipper. Those twin metal rails of teeth that hold your pants closed when you slide the little pole along it. See, today the word zipper refers to any such closure. But once upon a time, zipper was a registered trademark of the B.F. Goodrich Company. Now, Goodrich did not invent the thingy. In fact, several people invented it before Goodrich even got involved. The first time it was invented, it was patented by Elias Howe in 1851 as an automatic continuous clothing closure. But Howe didn't really see much use for it, so he didn't pursue it. Then, in 1893, Whitcomb Judson, who also invented air-driven streetcars, invented another different zipper, which he called a clasp locker. With the help of a businessman named Colonel Lewis Walker and a big debut at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, he did try to sell the clasp blocker. But no one was interested. It was invented a few more times by a few more people and met with little commercial success until the B.F. Goodrich Company bought the idea of another similar but slightly different version of the zipper from a man named Gideon Sunback. And they started using it on boots and tobacco pouches. And it actually did catch on, and it sold pretty well. Well enough that Goodrich wanted to expand the separable fastener on all sorts of clothes. And they started a bunch of massive ad campaigns around the phrase, zip er up. And they focused especially on the front of men's pants. In fact, there was a famous marketing battle in the 1930s between Goodrich and other clothing manufacturers over button flies or zip flies. It was called the Battle of the Fly. We kid you not. And the zipper won. And the marketing campaign stuck. And that's how it became known as the zipper. Which Goodrich tried to register as a trademark. And they were told, sorry, no. See, once everyone started wanting zipper fastened clothes, all sorts of companies started using all sorts of similar fastener closures. And they started calling them zippers. Anyone who made any sort of closure that was anything like the zipper capitalized on the popularity of the zipper campaign by advertising the things as zippers. And Goodrich lost out. And they tried to make a legal battle of it and register the trademark. But by this point, the Patent and Trademark Office saw that the word zipper had become a generic term it had entered the public consciousness as the word for that type of closure, not as a specific product manufactured by a specific company. And so they were denied the trademark. And this happens a lot, and companies are constantly fighting against it because a company that has spent years and millions of dollars establishing a reputation connected to a specific name or brand can lose it all if that word becomes so commonly and generally used that the Patent and Trademark Office decides the trademark doesn't mean anything anymore. And so, every year, companies beg and plead with journalists, authors, filmmakers, and all sorts of content creators not to use the names of their products unless they are specifically referring to the brand, and unless they specifically mark it with the little R in a circle, an enclosed R, as it's called, that indicates the name is a registered trademark. Seriously, they even take out ads. If you look through any magazine for writers or filmmakers, you can find ads from all sorts of companies begging you not to use the word Kleenex, registered trademark, 
when you mean any old facial tissue. Or not to use the word band-aid, registered trademark, when you mean any adhesive bandage. Or Clorox, registered trademark, when you mean bleach. Or Xerox, registered trademark, when you mean photocopy. And so on, and so on, and so on. And that brings us around to the word maelstrom. Now, you might think of a maelstrom as a whirlpool, or a vortex, a swirling, powerful water current that dashes ships against the rocks to strand hapless adventurers on deserted tropical islands, or that heralds the arrival of the Kraken, or a giant octorok, or a massive, magically enhanced sea witch at the climax of your film. And these days you're not wrong. But that's only because the word maelstrom has become genericized. So let's talk about the Saltstraman Maelstrom of Bado, Norway, the original Maelstrom. Just north of the Arctic Circle, along the coast of Norway, near the town of Bado, there's this fjord. That's fjord, not Ford, registered trademark, the automotive manufacturer. Basically, a fjord is a long, narrow inlet whose sides are generally high, steep cliffs. True, fjords are basically valleys cut into the coastline by glaciers. But the term has become a generic name for any such narrow inlet surrounded by high cliffs. Every six hours at this particular fjord, the tides change. Now, we've not really talked about tides before in much detail, but we assume you know that all of the seawater on Earth basically sloshes around, gravitationally attracted to the moon. As the moon revolves around the Earth, it pulls the water up beneath it and on the side of the Earth opposite to it, and that creates a rising and falling of the sea level, right? That's the tide, which has nothing to do with tide, registered trademark, the laundry detergent. So, when the sea level rises and falls along the coast of Norway, obviously, the water inside the fjord tries to rise and fall along with it. That's how water works. But the inlet's mouth is particularly narrow. It's less than two miles wide. And for the water level in the fjord to rise and fall, about 105 million gallons of water have to run in or out of the two-mile-wide gap. And it's chaos. Especially because of the jagged rocky coastline and rough, shallow seabed that plays havoc with the water current. What you get is an indescribable rush of water, roaring deafeningly and spinning off all sorts of vortices and whirlpools, some as wide as 30 feet and up to 15 feet deep. And at this point, we should talk a bit about the difference between a maelstrom, a whirlpool, and a vortex. And also mention that we are not discussing the whirlpool, registered trademark, brand of dishwashing appliances. Whirlpools and vortices happen when water currents encounter opposing currents or obstacles. As a result of the collision, the current is diverted and begins to flow in a circular direction. A whirlpool is thus just a body of water flowing in a circular direction. However, if the inrushing rotating current also creates a downward pull because the water can't escape the whirlpool except via flowing outward underwater, that's called a vortex. And since we're all about using the proper names for things, that distinction is important. A whirlpool is water running in a circle. A vortex is water running in a downward spiral. And a maelstrom? Well, maelstrom has been the generic term for either a particular large and powerful whirlpool or vortex, or for a large and powerful chaos of different currents that give rise to multiple whirlpools or vortices which is what happens in Norway at the Saltström and Maelström. The massive amounts of water being forced through a very narrow gap very quickly, where the currents are deflected by the rough shore, the seabed, and submerged rocks, leads to powerful, clashing currents flowing every which way, colliding and spinning up multiple whirlpools and vortices. And the Saltström and Maelström got the name Maelström from an old Dutch word, which means crushing stream and it was first called out on Dutch maps and named such in the 1560s. Now, we should note that what's happening at Saltström in Norway is not that unusual. 
In fact, there's places all over the world where clashing water currents, especially tidal currents, give rise to constant or else fairly regular whirlpools, vortices, and maelstroms. The Saltstraumen maelstrom is recognized as the biggest, fastest, and most powerful such maelstrom. But there is also the nearby Moskstraumen maelstrom in the Lofoten archipelago in Norway, and the popular Naruto no Uzushio, or Naruto whirlpools, which have nothing to do with the Naruto registered trademark comic book series. Well, not nothing, but we're not going to discuss Naruto right now. And there's the old Sao Whirlpool in New Brunswick, Canada. And many more. Now, obviously, whirlpools and vortices are evocative things, massive spirals of water that trap ships and drag them down to the watery depths. Well, at least that's how the stories go. Because in truth, except in places along the coast, whirlpools and vortices aren't really much danger to ships at all. In fact, whirlpools rarely occur away from coastlines. And they are mostly invisible, just circular flowing currents that can, sometimes, divert smaller ships. It's only where there's clashing currents and obstacles close to the surface that you really get such powerful currents. Smaller vessels can sometimes get dragged under or capsized by a powerful vortex, but the greater danger is that such vessels can be dashed into the coast or into underwater obstacles. But that doesn't prevent whirlpools and vortices and maelstroms from popping up in all sorts of myths and legends. Take, for example, Charybdis, a massive sea monster that has played havoc with multiple Greek heroes who took to the sea. Most notably Odysseus in the Odyssey and Jason in Jason and the Argonauts. Originally, Charybdis was a sea nymph, a sort of natural spirit of the sea, born of the union between Poseidon the god and the titan Gaia. Charybdis was the goddess of the tides, and she and her dad, Poseidon, actually got on pretty well, and they did many father-daughter activities that mostly involved conquering coastal lands that Zeus had laid claim to. They had this trick where Poseidon would spin up a massive storm at sea, and then Charybdis would ride the storm directly at some coastal area, flooding the whole thing, inundating town, sweeping away forest, the whole shebang. As you can imagine, Zeus wasn't too happy about this. He wanted to get rid of Charybdis, but he had to do so in a way that didn't screw with the tides, because those were important. For reasons. So Zeus captured Charybdis and transformed her into a bulbous frog-like sea monster and chained her at the bottom of the Strait of Messina, which is between Italy and Sicily. And each day, Charybdis would open her mouth and draw in huge volumes of water and then, later, expel it all again. Thus, the tides were maintained. The problem was, every time Charybdis swallowed the tide, she created a massive vortex in the water above her, which made the strait quite treacherous. And what made it even more treacherous was the fact that a giant six-headed serpent, Scylla, took up residence opposite Charybdis on the shore. Whenever sailors changed course to avoid Charybdis, they brought their ship into reach of Scylla. We should also note, for completeness, that Scylla had also once been a sea nymph. She'd been cursed and monstrified as a result of a love triangle with a sea god named Glaucus and a witch named Circe. That's a whole other story. Meanwhile, you might wonder just how the name of an obscure tidal phenomenon from a remote inlet in Norway became a generic synonym for a swirling, chaotic mass of water anywhere in the world. Well, that's thanks to a short story about coping with fear, especially in the face of certain death, written by the great American poet and author Edgar Allan Poe. Now, Poe is renowned for his short stories and poems, especially in the genre of mystery and horror. But what's interesting is that despite the fact that Poe had a fraught and troubled life, all indications are that he chose to stick with horror themes, especially gothic horror, because that was what was popular at the time, and that he himself was not fond of many of his most famous works. The fact is that Poe faced a lot of challenges supporting himself. He was one of the first American writers to support himself entirely by his writing, and by all accounts, he only barely managed to do so. 
A series of economic crises, including the Panic of 1837, hurt the American publishing industry. The lack of international copyright laws led to him losing out on lots of income thanks to sales of unauthorized copies of his most popular works overseas. And so, he chased fads and wrote whatever would sell, and begged unscrupulous publishers to publish his works. And pay him. And so it was, in 1841, just seven years before Poe would be found on the streets of Baltimore, dying of a delirium whose cause to this day remains unexplained, that Poe rushed a short story out to market to capitalize on the popularity of his works in France, works that had been translated without his permission and without credit. The story was called A Descent into the Maelstrom, and it popularized the word maelstrom across the Western world as a torrential sea current and a crushing whirlpool. In the story, a guide leads the narrator to the top of a fictional mountain in Norway to give him a view of a massive tidal current swirling in a fjord below them. The narrator is terrified of the height and the current and is unable to cope with the sight, so the guide tells him a tale. And the brunt of the story is the guide's tale within a tale. The guide explains that he and his brother used to brave the wild currents to fish the waters of the fjord. That they were the only ones brave enough to do so, but they survived because they had the currents scheduled down to a science. They knew when the maelstrom rose and fell, and for a long time they prospered. But one night, due to a sudden storm and an accident, they lost track of the time and were unable to escape the inlet before the maelstrom swirled to life. The ship was caught and it was being swallowed by the massive swirling vortex. The guide's brother was insensible with panic, and at first, so was the guide. But then, the guide calmed himself, and he noticed that while the ship was being drawn down into the vortex, along with a bunch of heavier debris, lighter debris and flotsam was actually floating safely along the edges of the vortex. The guide tried to point this out to his brother, but to no avail. His brother was lost to panic. So the guide abandoned his brother and the ship to float to safety on a small barrel, though he was forever changed by his experience staring into the formless, chaotic abyss and a terrible vision of heaven and hell. While there is a lot to this story about the nature of existence and human consciousness, and the spectacular imagery alone is worth the read, the most useful takeaway for us, now, is that when everything around you is a swirling torrent of chaos beyond your control, sometimes the best way to escape is to keep a cool head, consider your surroundings, and calmly ride out the current. And eventually, the stress will subside, and you'll be left with nothing more than a bit of fatigue and a little bit of a headache. And then you can just take some aspirin. Registered trademark. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Thank you.